if you are new here, uh, we are in the second week of our Easter Tide series on Alive. Uh, and you might think this is the second week. Yes, last week was the first week with Easter when Jesus appears to the woman at the tomb. And I think sometimes we get into Easter and we think it's only one week. Uh, and I know that we do that because I was at Starbucks this morning and um, I was hanging out with one of the baristas that I've befriended for the last four or five years of this journey. He's actually a believer and uh, I've, I've ridiculed him enough uh, about a believer working on Sunday mornings at Starbucks. Let the non-believers do that. You get your, your, yourself in church and he, he continues to work on Sunday, so that's enough of that. Um, and so, but nonetheless, I, I, I talked to him and actually he pulled me aside and he goes, hey man, what's a good word today? And I was like, oh man, here we go. This is my first service right here, my first opportunity to, to preach this good word today. And I said, hey man, he's still risen. He was like, I mean, okay, all right, I guess that's it. And I was like, no, no, like, he just kind of dismissed me in a way. And I was like, no, no, like for real, he's, he's really still risen. See, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about this still risen Jesus in this Easter tide. Uh, season on the Christian calendar. It's Easter tide. It's not just one day. It's actually 40 days that Jesus appears to people. Over 500 people did he appear to during this time. After the resurrection and before his ascension, is he appearing to over 500 people? He appears to the women at the grave. He appears to the disciples. At some point, he appears to Peter alone. And then he now he's now appearing uh, to these disciples on the road to Emmaus. One of them, whose name is Cleopas. The other one we don't know. We don't know if it was his wife. We don't know if it was his buddy. We have no idea who this other person is. But that's not the point. The point is that he is still risen. And he was like, so this is my buddy at Starbucks. He goes, so, okay, good. And I was like, so we're going to talk about, you know, the road to Emmaus. And he's like, not ringing a bell. And I was like, okay, well, like, let me just explain to you what the road to Emmaus is. It's when they basically asked Jesus, where have you been? For all this time. Like, have you, are you the only one not paying attention? And he goes, and I said, you know, basically that, that he, he didn't realize he was talking to Jesus. He's like, this is not, I don't remember this story at all. And so I just kind of left there with a renewed insight that though we may have been Christian for a long time, this may be a forgotten story because it happens after Jesus died on the cross. And we're really good at Christianity until Jesus dies on, died on the cross on a Friday. We, we start to celebrate again on Easter. And then after that, it's like we just skip right to the book of Acts and we're off and running. And so let's rediscover what this road to Emmaus was truly all about. Uh, we find ourselves on the first Easter, still on Easter Sunday, after Jesus had risen from the, de from the dead, appeared to the women. And we don't know how long has... has has gone by between the women and now these people that are on their road home. We do know that Jesus cut in on them. We do know that, inter that Jesus interrupted their seven mile journey, which is about a two to three hour walk, um, that all of a sudden Jesus breaks in on them and starts to ask them some tough questions, some really good questions. So it's on this first Easter Sunday that two of Jesus' disciples who were with the others in that room, wherever they were, they had heard the women's testimony about Jesus, and they're wondering, how in the world could this ever be true? They're now on their journey back home, out of Jerusalem, headed to Emmaus, seven miles away, and they're talking about, quote-unquote, all these things that had happened. All these things that had happened throughout this week of this King Jesus who rode in on a donkey who then was betrayed and deserted and crucified and then lay in the tomb and for all they know, robbery really did take place. And you, you see the desperation in their answers to Jesus later on. They're saying, you know, besides, it's the third day. He said he was going to rise from the dead and we, nobody's seen him. They just know that the, the grave is empty and the only people that have seen him are these women and we don't know what to do with their testimony. Some tough stuff. They were talking about all these things they, that were happening. You could see it in, their, in, in what they're saying. They are disoriented. They are disappointed. And they are disillusioned by the fact that Jesus was brutally murdered. After seeing so many displays of power. After hearing of so many displays of authority over, over bread and fish. Over storms and weather. Over sickness over demons themselves, he still died? 
he still couldn't do anything against mighty Rome, that when he had plenty of opportunity to defeat Rome, he didn't do it. No, they're disoriented, they're disillusioned, that this was the guy that was supposed to come and redeem Israel, the Bible says. And yet he didn't do it. What in the world has gone wrong? It's natural questions that lend us, for us to ask this question. So I would ask you this question to just kind of consider as we get going. What do you do when you become disoriented? What do you do when you become disappointed and disillusioned by God? You thought he was going to do X when in fact he actually did four. It's not even a letter that he did. It's a number. So he's so different than what you expected that it can cause you to just kind of be taken aback and pushed back on your heels and you don't even know what to do now. So what do you do? There's three main um, responses that I think we normally have in the midst of disorientation, disillusionment. One is to sulk. Like we play the victim and we, we, we wonder, you know, how it is that, that, that we got to this point, what went wrong, and that's actually where they're at. In 17, it says that they stood still and were sad. We can sulk. Some of us, when we get disillusioned by God, we don't just sulk, we sin. We, we just go, you know what, enough of this. Why care about personal holiness anymore? I'm just going to go and just run off a deep end. So this happens to, to you or maybe to, to quote unquote me on any given Friday night when I've had a long week and the cookies start calling me. And I can't have two, I've got to have eight. And you might think that's funny, but it's, it's a confession of sin. It just is. And so like, that, like that's how subtle it is that we start to just go, you know what? Enough of this. I've had enough. I deserve X, Y, or Z. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, da- if it's not a running into sin, maybe just dabble in it. I mean, after all, it's cookies. I mean, after all, it's just, it's just a, it's just, you know, this. Whatever you want to fill that in. A good thing becoming a God thing. We cheat on God because we expect Him to, to dispense the goods that we want from Him when we want it, how we want it. The Old Testament has some strong language for that that I'm not going to go into. But perhaps we need to be reminded that his withholding of good might actually be for our good. We sulk, we sin. And some of us, if it's not a sulk issue, we play the victim. Some of us, it's not a sin issue. Maybe some of us just sprint ahead. We just quit caring about his wisdom. We quit caring about what the word actually says. And we just go, you know what? Like enough. I just, I, he's not answering me in the time that I need it. His people seem to be, you know, not really helping me along with what I want them to help me with. And so I'm just going to forego that whole process and pursue whatever it is that I want to pursue. My kingdom, my priorities, my agenda. And we push aside the one and only king and his kingdom. See, what do we do when we are disillusioned, disappointed, disoriented by God, by us not getting our way with God? As we discover what it looks like to journey with Jesus, we meet our friends on the road to Emmaus because surely that's exactly what they're doing. They're on a journey home. And so as we join them, my question is this, how can we find the hope and healing for our journey? Well, we see some guidelines in this. And the first guideline that we see as far as finding hope and healing for the journey with Jesus is that we do that with, with God's people. We journey with others. We walk with others in this Christian life. The Christian walk was never meant to be traveled alone, but instead only with his family, his Christian community. You see, our questions that we have in the midst of disillusionment or disorientation, the questions that we have cannot be answered on our own. Instead, you've got to ask those questions with safe and with truthful people. They, they really need to be both. Safe and truthful. Those safe people are those that are trustworthy. Hopefully, they're a little bit further along in your journey of faith. It doesn't mean that they're older than you. It does sometimes mean that they are, it does though mean that they are further along in their faith than you. And so those are the safe people that I'm talking about. They know you. They, they realize that you're not like giving up your, your faithfulness to God by asking hard questions. Instead, they, you've just got to follow Jesus, and as you're doing so, you're finding some safe people 
to continue to have the conversation? Have you seen those safe people confess sin? You see, how is it that we discern whether or not they're safe or not? Have they confessed any sin to you? Do they act humbly or do they act like they, they kind of have it all together? How do they treat their spouse or their kids? See, those are the people that you know that you can trust your soul with. Ones that treat their, their spouse and their kids with respect. The ones that can humbly just depend on the Lord knowing they don't have it all together or have all the answers. The ones that prove it to you by confessing their sin to you and to God. That safe person that you need along for the journey, though, doesn't just remain safe and therefore silent. No, safe and truthful. See, it's a terrible thing to throw your opinion out in an echo chamber or to throw your opinion out or your desires up against a mirror because all you're going to see is yourself. And social media is a bad place to test out new ideas for life. Right? You, you, you throw out an opinion on social media. Do you realize all the people that you're friends with are your friends? Like, they just agree with you. They're just going to agree with you. You're not going to get a whole lot of good, truthful, honest feedback on life in a situation like that. Or even in group texts or things like that. Instead, like, take people to coffee and to lunch and to dinner and to sit down with them eyes to eyes, flesh on flesh. And and, 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 and trust yourself to a hard truth. So one of the things I find in pastoring people over many years now of doing that is that they will find themselves in community, but with only people that agree with them, that look like them, that have the same Republican beliefs as them, and and there's no diversity of thought. It's just an echo chamber. But instead, what would it look like for you to go and sit down with someone who you know is safe? You may not know them all that well, but hey, they confess sin, they're humble, they treat their family with respect, and you know you're going to get an honest answer from them. So the worst thing that we can do is to, to, to journey with Jesus and then to fool ourselves into thinking that my counselors are wise, when instead they're, they're not. They're just, they're congenial. They look like you, they think like you. There's not much diversity of thought. That's a, that's a huge mistake for us. That we would kind of just surround ourselves with people that would agree with us, but instead get with someone who will tell you the hard truth that is rooted in the scriptures, rooted in what God has to say on the matter. If you don't know this, and I just announced this, but some of you were out of the room, um, our neighborhood groups have a vision to be a family. And you've heard the vision of family, missionary, servant, but truly to be a family. And as we are a family, we need to be good, and hopefully we're getting good at listening to one another, being curious about one another's journeys, not just commiserating, but actually being curious about one another's journeys. And as we do that, we hear kind of how our wounds are there, or that we need some healing, and we we look for ways to inject the gospel into each other's life. Hopefully that's what we're doing in our neighborhood groups. And so we're doubling down on that vision this summer as we do these crowded house gatherings, as we we truly come together as as local uh, opportunities to not just preach and be the gospel with one another, but to do that with our neighbors. We're doubling down on that because we want to be a family that's really good at being curious about where we need to hear the gospel again and again and again, because let's face it, we don't go off the deep end. We don't go, sit, go, go chase after cookies on a Friday night. We don't go and cheat on God because we don't know the answer. We go and do those things because we forget how good God is. We forget how much he loves us. We forget that we truly are made new from the inside out by God's spirit. We forget those things. And so we need God's people to remind us again and again again. And again, so how can we find our hope and healing along in this journey? First things first, do it with others, those safe and truthful people. Second thing that we can do that this road to Emmaus is going to help us understand as these two walk together and then Jesus cut in on them, the second thing that we can do is we can ask God hard questions. We can ask God hard questions. You see, what I love about this, in verse 17, uh, Jesus starts to ask them some hard questions. 
They're, they're, they're talking about all these things about Friday to Sunday, or maybe it's Sunday to Sunday. Their eyes are being kept from recognizing who Jesus is. He's some kind of a shapeshifter. I don't understand how he does it, but he does it. Verse 17, he says this, right? And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still and they looked sad. You see, they're, they're, they're sulking. Then it continues on in verse 18. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered them, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who's do, who does not know the things that have happened here in these days, there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? He's asking them really basic but beautiful questions. He's continuing to model out for us what a safe and truthful person is going to be. He knows what's going on, yet he's a safe person, but he's truthful. And so he's starting to ask them, What things? What's in your heart that's truly bothering you? And the response is beautiful because the response reveals their heart issues. And they ask some really good questions in the midst of suffering and disappointment. And so three questions that they ask that are good for us to ask as well. Maybe we need to ask this in the midst of suffering, in the midst of disorientation. Maybe we need to ask God, are you the only one not paying attention? You ever felt that way? Throughout your week, are you the only one that's not paying attention here? Because it's like right here in front of my eyes of suffering, of disorientation. I mean, everyone around me can see how hard this journey truly is. Are you the only one, God, that's not paying attention? You see, for Christians, it's become so happy clappy uh, on Sunday mornings, and that tends to be our only experience of the Christian walk that we have forgotten how to lament. We've forgotten that there are beautiful passages. Well, number one, there's a book called Lamentations. When's the last time you read that one in your quiet time? Oh, it's coming up, I'm sure. In your one year reading, it's coming up. Beautiful book, really hard to read. But if you don't have time, which we don't right now, to read all the book of Lamentations, just start with Psalm 13, which we do have time for. If you want to know how to lament well, read Psalm, Psalm 13. It's going to come up on the screen. But this is a beautiful question. It's, it's right in line with, are you the only one not paying attention? And it starts off with those three words. How long, Lord? How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? You ever felt that way? You ever felt like God's just forgotten you along in this journey? Maybe he's watching. Maybe he's, maybe he's listening to you. And he's about to cut in on your journey. So you can ask him some hard questions. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my own soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Oh, man, it's just crashing down. Lord, consider and answer me. I mean, this is like, hello, like on, just doing this number with flares. You're on a deserted island. And you're just going, consider and answer me, Lord. Oh, Lord, my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over you. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. See, it's a beautiful thing to ask those hard questions of God. But do not fall into the trap of accusation. For as far and as deep as the depression may go for this psalmist, and for the book of Lamentations, there's never accusation, but instead a continual entrusting of themselves to the faithfulness of God. We keep reading in Psalm 13, verse 5. Oh, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. You, you've not answered me for I don't know how long. I haven't heard your voice in forever. I mean, are you going to just leave me to rot here? No, but I trust you, God. I've trusted in your steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. When we lose heart in all circumstance, we can always go back to the joy that we have in salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. What do you mean bountifully? I've been in the desert. I haven't heard from you. I'm disoriented. You can always look back and go, oh, no, you have always dealt bountifully with me. Generously. We can ask God the hard question just like they ask him in verse 18. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Are you the only one not paying attention? I wonder what you're clinging to that you wished God would pay attention to. I wonder what dis 
disorientation or, or disappointment, you've clung on to, to just kind of use it as, as an excuse to separate your, yourself ever so slightly from the presence of God, from truly entrusting yourself to the goodness and the generosity of God. That's the first question they ask, asking hard questions about to God are good things. The second thing they, they ask, and they just ask, I mean, truly it's this, have I misplaced my hope? Look at verse 21. Well, I'll go back to 19. And he said, what, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. Interesting that they use prophet. They're already starting to doubt whether or not he was Messiah. A prophet. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But 21 comes along. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Most disappointments with God come from a misplaced hope. That we put a hope in God for him to do something for us that he never said he was going to do. Or if he said he was going to do it, it's going to probably not be the way that we expected. If there's anything we can learn from when Jesus came, it would be that. Oh, he's doing it, but it's going to be far greater and better than you ever hoped or dreamed. It's not just to be redeeming Israel, friends. No, no, it's all people. Not just from, from, from our, our oppressor Rome, but the oppression of sin and death. So he came, but it was far greater than they ever hoped or dreamed. They had a misplaced hope. Our disappointments come from hope in something other than God or worse it is in something that is close to God, but it's not actually Him at all. Some ways that that happens for us today could be in a formula, right? We get so caught up in A plus B equals C in our Christian faith that our formulas, based on our performance, may they die, that God can birth life in us that is based on Christ's performance as our identity. The dreams for our life, may they Come to pass, and may they be put in the ground so that God will birth a dream in us that is His and not our own. The ideals that we have, I don't know about you, but I find myself being really idealistic sometimes with the shoulds and the oughts that just capture me throughout the week. Well, it shouldn't be this way, and it should be this way, and it ought not to be this way, and it ought to be this way. Those are idealistic ideas about how God really works, but the ideals will give way to the real things. We can keep our feet on the ground and engage faithfully. I'll go first on confession of sin on this one. So I thought we would be planting at least two churches by now as a church. Some four years in, my idealistic vision was like, oh man, we're just going to be doing it. And there's going to be people that want to do this. We're going to talk about being a missionary enough to where people will be like, oh yeah, I got this. Like we're missionaries. We're going to do this thing. But then just like the fallen state of the world just captures our, our minds and our affections and our desires. And it just doesn't go as fast and quickly as I once thought. And so maybe it's not two or three years or four. Maybe it's like seven, ten, or twenty. I don't know. Like well, I've, just, I've just released my grip on that timeline to go, man, like there's a, there's a realistic thing that God really is doing. But I'll miss it and be disappointed if all I think about is the ideal. And so I'll just, I'll just go first. Like, that's my thing. But then I, I just sit back and I think about our church. Like, I don't hear criticism in our church. I don't hear, man, I really wish that, you know, Chris would play this song. Except for me. I really, I, like, I don't hear, just be playing it out there, right? Like, I, I don't ever hear that. I don't, I don't ever hear these, these, like, petty little conversations amongst ourselves. And if it's happening, it's happening away from me. I don't hear a lot of criticism about what happens on a stage. You know why? Because you all have bought into the beautiful vision that this is not where Christianity happens. It happens out there. And I do hear stories about, I mean, like, I had Easter in my front yard, like Easter lunch in my front yard, and seven people came. Oh, you were doing that this year? Like, that happened? That was the thing that you did? Yeah, and it was crazy, and it was good, and it was a little confusing, but we, we loved it. We're going to do it again. Okay, great. Like, what a beautiful thing that I would miss if I only thought about, oh, we, we should have been playing churches by now. But just coming off of the ideal and into the real, there's a lot to be grateful for. All is not lost, friends. Jesus is here with us, ready to lead us, into a better reality. A new dream of being okay with things that are not 
okay. And that starts with ourselves. If you know anything about me, you know that one of my heroes in the faith is Larry Crabb. Larry Crabb said this in one of his books, Becoming a True Spiritual Community. He talks about disappointment. He talks about disillusionment. That's why I like him. He'll just tackle the hard stuff. This is what he says about disappointment. Disappointment, too, in the Christian life is inevitable. More than that, disappointment is good. Can you, can you believe that? Are you so clung to Christ that your disappointments about life can still be good? Following Christ must take us through the seasons of disappointment because Christianity remakes our dreams before it fulfills them. We've got a lot of new and non-believers that come to our church and, and get remade by the Holy Spirit and then start to walk this new walk with Jesus that's just so different than what they've been walking before. You mean I don't just fill up my schedule with things to do and Netflix and everything else. No, no. There's a margin there to follow Jesus. You mean like I don't just get to go sleep in and just go have brunch on a Sunday morning? No, no. Like it's good to gather with the saints to be reminded about the gospel. And that he's remaking dreams before he fulfills them. And that process is excruciating. But worth it, friends. But worth it. Whereas is it, death never felt good. I don't know anybody that's died that's been like, that felt good. Like Jesus probably didn't come back and be like, man, that felt great. No, instead he's saying, look, touch, feel. It's really me. There's something new that's happening. It's worth it. There's resurrection at the end of this quote unquote tunnel. See, that's the beauty of all this. That's the second question. That, like, how have I misplaced my hope? And then the third question they ask is, how am I culturally blind? Verse 22 through 24, let's read this, and then we'll get to our third point and be done. See what I just did there? I pointed to the end, but we're far from it. <laughs> Verse 22, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. So they're going on, and they're going, like, besides all this, the third day since he said these things were going to happen, have started to happen. Moreover, as if that wasn't enough, some women went to the tomb <laughs> of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they have seen visions of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. What are they saying? Look, the women came back. They talked about how Jesus was, was not there and they saw him and visions of angels and everything else. And we don't know what to do with that. The book of Mark says they did not believe them. So they're kind of left just going home. Again, this, this state of disorientation. And as they're going home, they're, they're culturally blind. So I wonder if in our disorientation, if we're culturally blind, how would that translate to us? Not just with women or men. But my fear is that we are so culturally blended up with Christianity, we don't know what Christianity is anymore. That's how culturally blind we are. We don't know what is Christian and what is not Christian anymore. We've blended the two so well that there is, it's a really difficult thing to discern between the two. But Christianity is meant to be weird. You know how we know? Because Jesus was basically killed for being weird. For being different than what they expected. He went into the temple and tossed the tables, right? He was like, nope. Not having this. You mean gentle Jesus was angry? Mm-hmm. They were making a mockery of prayer. They were making a mockery of dependence upon God. And so Jesus comes in and is kind of this weirdo on our behalf so as to pave for us this road of being different, of being rejected. How can you be rejected if you blend in so well? You can't. And Jesus will continue to remind us no servant is above his master. Just as I suffered, so you too shall suffer. How are we culturally blind? Perhaps we need to just not blend in so well. If you and I live a Christian life and no one has asked us where our hope is, as the Bible assumes that they will, perhaps it's because we're doing it wrong. Perhaps. Perhaps it's because we traded in Christianity following the wild and free Jesus for a list of rules that we now keep in order to be nice people. So this is like my struggle on a daily basis. Um, I think I've told you a story before about the softball fields. I now have to tell you another story about the baseball fields with my four-year-old when I heard another coach 
tell a four-year-old to run through another four-year-old. And I don't know what happened after that. I just know that I was really close to that other coach asking him, hey, did you just tell a four-year-old to run through another four-year-old? Because I find that offensive. Oh, no, I didn't mean it violently. I was like, that's a little bit too much, though, because the four-year-old doesn't know what you mean. And there's just a part of me that's like, like that's the temple for me, and I'm going in, and I'm like, I got to just, I, I, there's a part of me that's just, just turning the temple over, the table's over a little bit to go, dude, we cannot do that with our children. We can't just be so hyped up into our cultural competitiveness that we lead them into folly. It's not okay. That's a little thing, but it's a big thing in the moment for me. Maybe that's why the Lord just, you know, takes me off the softball field and the baseball field every once in a while. Hey, dude, not that important. Not your temple. Not your tables. Let somebody else take care of that. But that's the truth, right? Is that there's, there's, there's all of a sudden, there's a weirdness to the Christian life. What are some ways that you can live weird? Say no to unnecessary busyness. Create margin for hospitality. Fight for the orphan and the widow and the poor. Intentionally set aside a, like your Friday nights or your Saturday nights to go be with your lost neighbors. Maybe you turn down that promotion because it isn't keep in keeping with your greater goals. Spend your vacation time out on mission. No matter what it is, whatever we can do, will we follow Jesus? And when we do that, we will be weird. We'll be outcasts. We can't do both. Will we journey with him in this way? Will we ask those hard questions? How can I move past our cultural blindness into truly following Jesus? See, asking the hard question is one thing. The hard part is listening for the answers. The hard part is truly waiting for his answer and responding. Look at verse 25 about what Jesus has to say. And he said to them, O foolish ones, O slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer for these things and enter into his glory? See, the first answer that Jesus begins to give to them was that obedience is greater than knowledge. He says, no, no, he's rebuking them not for their lack of understanding. He goes into their assumption that the scriptures should have been telling them that truly the Savior must come and suffer. And so it was their lack of discernment, their lack of obedience to these things, which should have led them to their increasing faith. See, we can be more focused on understanding Scripture than obeying the Spirit, which are not the same thing. When we, when we focus on understanding Scripture, it can lead to knowledge and pride. And when we focus on obeying the Spirit, it will lead to wisdom and humility. And so for us... Will we believe the scriptures when it said that truly the Savior must come to suffer? To save us through suffering. Like, I don't know about you, but when I suffer, I tend to find that I lose my sight on the Savior. I get so caught up in circumstances that I lose my sight on the goodness and the presence of God. And I start to ask those questions. Are you even paying attention? What are you doing in this mess? Jesus rebukes them, but also instructs them about the suffering Savior. Verse 26, I just read it. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then, verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interrupted them. He interpreted to them, excuse me, in all the scriptures, the things concerning with himself. He goes back to Moses. Love that he does that goes back to Moses. Moses wrote the Torah. He start, perhaps he started with Genesis 3.15 where the wounded healer was prophesied. This first prophecy of Jesus where it says that he shall bruise your head, serpent, and you, serpent, shall bruise his heel. There is suffering amidst redemption. Perhaps he started to talk about Deuteronomy 18 where Moses says there's going to be a prophet that comes from amongst you. You must listen to him. And he knows they won't. Perhaps he went there. Perhaps he went to Exodus 12 where he talks about the Passover lamb which needed to be slaughtered so that the blood of the Passover lamb could be spread over our households so that the angel of death may not visit our homes but that we may be passed over wasn't it that event that John looked at when he saw Jesus and he said behold the lamb of God who takes away our sin wasn't it that that the prophets were looking back to and then forward to in Jesus 
The suffering servant would come in Isaiah 53. And in four verses, these are all the words that are said about Jesus 700 years before his death. Despised rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, not esteemed, carrying our sorrows, stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, pierced, crushed, carrying our wounds, oppressed, and then led to slaughter like a lamb. Shouldn't they have seen those things? And Jesus is giving them this beautiful education in a two or three hour journey. And he's saying, look, all the prophets have pointed up to this. Man, how could they have seen it? Better yet, how could they have not seen it? Wasn't it Jesus who said in Luke 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed and on the third day be raised. These sojourners were tired. They were sad. They were weary. And their journey had been long. But that does not keep them from practicing hospitality. So how can we continue to wait for these answers? We can remember that obedience is greater than knowledge. We can remember that suffering has a divine purpose. We can remember that God is calling us to practice hospitality amidst our weary and sad circumstances. He's still going to interrupt, him, uh, inject himself into our lives. You see the beauty in this? Is that they don't know who Jesus is until they, enter, they invite him into the home. They have no idea that it's still Jesus, still asking them all these things, explaining all these things to them. They have no idea it's still him. But they're weary. They're sad. They could have made excuses to just let Jesus go on his journey. After all, the Bible says he pretended that it was time for him to continue on in this journey, but they plead with him to stay, and he stays. He stays. So would we practice hospitality? Would we plead with those that are also weary in their journey, have also found sadness in their journey? Would we push aside excuses of our own long journey and invite them? Come break bread at table. Perhaps it's in that moment that Jesus will reveal himself to you and to them. And when he does, would not your heart burn? There is no greater feeling in the world and your heart burning at the revelation of Jesus. Have you felt that? Have you experienced that? I mean, there, you, can, you can point back to some times in life where God just touched you, spoke to you, led you, broke you, whatever it was for your good and his glory. Do you remember that and how your, how your heart burned within you? I can remember a lot of days where he's touched, where he's spoken, where he's broken, so as to lead me into entrusting myself to him, to go and tell my friends, just as these brothers, or maybe a brother and a sister, go back now to Jerusalem. They don't stay at home. They, they, they see this, this Jesus for who he truly is after their hearts burned within them. And they go back and tell their brothers, no, for real, the women aren't crazy. He really did rise from the dead, and he's here with us. Our hearts burned. Will we have some sort of experience with him? Will we long for that? And then look back at those times and go, oh, you're faithful. I remember. You're faithful. I remember. Will that be the thing that we long for as a people? For our hearts to burn. Because the Spirit lands on us and God reveals himself to us. And when he does, what will we do? Will we be a people that go and tell others? See, that's going to be the theme. All throughout this Easter tide season, into Ascension, and then into Pentecost, this great theme that will land every single week. Will you go and tell others? Or will you keep that burning light all to yourself? It's a good question for us to end on. Let's pray. Father, we know that you have many mysteries that are waiting to be revealed to us. Would we so look for you? Would we be so patient for as you to cut in on us? Would we 
open to this new education about how we misread the Scriptures. I mean, I thought it was about this. And would we open ourselves up to your Holy Spirit to just go, no, no, it was about X and Y and 14 and 374. That's what it was about. It wasn't about what you made it. It was about what I have made. Father, would you help us see these things? Would you help us depend on you? Would you help us understand you? See, the beauty about these resurrection appearances is that they have, they, they're starting to make sense of things, but they really don't know what exactly is happening yet. Maybe that's some of us. We don't know exactly what's happening yet, but we can tell God's doing something. Maybe we need to talk about these things with people. Maybe we need to find some safe and truthful people to just point us back to your word, to point us back to your spirit, to lead us and counsel us and comfort us along this journey. Be encouraged to ask hard questions, but also be encouraged to wait for your answer. Would you help us in these things? Would you help us respond? Would you, O oh Holy Spirit, continue to do what you do? And that is to transform hearts. That is to convict us of sins. That is to lead us into repentance. That is also to lead us into further trust and, and faithfulness in the good news. That Jesus has come for weary and weary sinners. For those that are cynical, and for those that are easily trusting of themselves into others. For those that are weary, for those that don't, aren't weary at all, they still got plenty of capacity left, but are headed in the wrong direction. Would you be, continually be gracious and gentle and patient with us as we journey with you? So Holy Spirit, do your thing. Help us. We love you, and we're grateful. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.